So hey, what's up, everybody? Today we got our special guest once again, my man Marcellus Wiley, former NFL All Pro player, former broadcaster, ESPN and FS1, author of Never Shut Up, and founder and CEO of ProjectTransition.org. Marcellus Wiley, welcome to the show. What's up, brother Charles? <laughs> How are you, Papa? <laughs> Uh, I'm doing, I love it. I'm, Congratulations, I'm doing for real, man. Welcome to real love. This is real love. Something greater than yourself. I love it, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. For those of you who don't know, I just recently became a dad, so I was telling Marcellus about it off air. So, uh, super excited, and I told him I joined the club. So uh, he he was he was cracking up when I told him that I, I don't sleep anymore. So. It's pretty, pretty nah, cool. Nah, you, now you barely in the club. Like, you just <laughs> left the door, Matt. You right by the door because I got four of these little itty bitties. But, man, it's such a blessing. And when you see you in another version and then the blank canvas of how you can create and now help influence a greater version of yourself, that's what fatherhood and parenting is all about, man. I look forward to the journey with you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, man. Well, Man, we've been trying to get on here for quite some time. There have been so many topics, so many things that have happened. I was like, man, I wish we could have Marcellus on because there were so you many You were pregnant. Things. I was like, man, he don't want me. He's just pregnant. Come on, man, let's <laughs> no, do it. No, no, man. He, he knows. I was, I, was, I was dealing with some stuff. So I was like, man, like these would be such great topics to get your opinion on. But anyway, nevertheless, we're here. We got a great show. I got a bunch of stuff I want to get into and ask you about. But I got to start with the first one just to get your take on it. So- Recently, Shannon Sharp, you know, uh, a, a former um, Hall of Fame player, big, big uh, media personality. He was on his show, uh, Nightcap, with Chad Ochocinco. And he stirred up some controversy, not in a bad way, but he stirred up some controversy when he said that Taylor Swift is a bigger draw uh, for the NFL than Beyonce. And when he said that, mm. even Chad... Uh, Ocho Cinco pushed back and was like, bro, you, are you serious? And Shannon Sharp was like, no, trust me. The NFL would rather have Taylor Swift showing up to those games than Beyonce. So the question I got to ask, uh, ask you is somebody who played in the NFL, who knows a lot about the NFL, what, do you, what did you think when Shannon Sharp said that? Yeah, I thought he was dead on when he said that. I think he was speaking from experience and not just playing the experience. Uh, I was a former player rep for nine of my 10 years. So that means you get to go at that time. We would take trips to Hawaii and get privy to the NFL PAs, books, marketing, the business, the economics of the game, as well as what the NFL and their intentions were. So when you start to go into those meetings, you realize quickly there is something with the NFL that's a common thread. Hmm. Uh, it's a game that's militaristic. Um, we, we don't really think about it that way, uh, but it is a game that has structure. They want superiority. They want structure. They want also to go out there and everyone to know who they are in the hierarchy. So mm. very structured, kind of like the military, right? Mm. You got ownership, you got executives, you got coaches, you got players, you got fans, just like you got privates and sergeants, you know, and captains, et cetera. Like they think about it in those terms. People don't really hear about that. What people also don't know is that the NFL promotes uniformity. They mm. want everyone out there as a player to really just stand out by performance, nothing else. Now, that has changed over the years because these personalities and social media, but at their core, that's why there's a uniform policy. You know, mm -hmm. pull your socks up. Mm -hmm. I want all you guys to have your socks up. Wear your thigh pads. No one wears thigh pads anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, look this way. Every uniform's the same. The only thing's different is your name on the back, et cetera. So that's kind of their core principles. Now, when you start thinking in those terms, then you start thinking about what, Taylor Swift is as an artist mm -hmm. and what Beyonce is at a, as an artist. Uh, one is a little more extravagant than the other, even though they're both at the top tier of being who they are. I think the NFL is more comfortable for no other reason, but Taylor Swift and her performances and what she embodies is in a safer space to them and in more alignment to what they are at their core. Mm. Now, I just went to a Beyonce concert. I haven't been to a Taylor Swift one. Uh, but Beyonce's fan base, woo, 
all over the place, brother. I'm talking mm, about mm, uh, mm. you see guys with fishnets on, and then you see guys <laughs> over there with sh- suits on. Like, like it's just like, dog, okay. And then you go see girls, just little girls losing their mind, and you'll see old ladies, old aunties still got acting you. like they still got it. Got you, you know, it's just, it's all over the place, and I think it's not as compact as what Taylor Swift and the Swifties are. So mm. I'm with Shannon. I think the NFL rather have something they could digest easier than what Beyonce brings. So you you actually think that, do you think that the NFL knew this or it was just something that they stumbled upon and they were like, because funny enough, when I when I kept on seeing the Taylor Swift post I on ESPN, on, I'm, talking, I'm talking about Instagram, I kept on seeing like, uh, you know, people fo- that follow the NFL, like guys say, no, not another Taylor Swift post. No, not another one. People leaving this yeah. in the comments and cracking up. But nevertheless, the NFL st- still keeps pushing it. Do you think that um, now that they kind of struck goal or they figured out that, hey, we have a new audience, do you think that they're going to continue to push Taylor Swift and maybe artists like that to reach a new audience? Do you think they're going to listen to their oh, core absolutely. customers? absolutely. I, I think not? the NFL stumbled upon this. Mm-hmm. I don't think this was contrived. Um, it's hard to contrive this. Like, hey, Travis Kelsey, how you doing? I know you've been dating a lot of black women. Um, now, can you uh, go date Taylor Swift for us real quick and help our bottom line and yours? And, you know, you get them Pfizer dollars and $20 million. Like, ain't nobody doing all that. Like, it's so funny when you're on the outside of anything. It's always with some suspicion and conspiracy. But when you're on the inside, it's just like, no, nah, dog, I just, dog, how you and her go out? How you meet her? I, I just said hello. Like, you know what I mean? Like, everybody else was so scared to say hi to her. I said hi, and she was like, let's go. So I think the NFL stumbled upon this. And then from there, they saw the opportunity because they're opportunistic. Taylor Swift is opportunistic. Travis Kelsey is opportunistic. I am. Everybody sees this. Jay-Z and Beyonce became that thing because it was power couples at play everywhere. And then they were like, who else qualifies on our level to really get the details and nuances of a day, right? right? Who else knows about security detail? Who else knows about, hey, the chef, the butler, and the house manager all got a court. These are things that if you just try to holler at your girl down the street, she'd be like, what are you talking about? So I think game recognizes game, and the NFL <clears throat> is the biggest game we got in this country, and they promoted it. You just said something that I was just thinking about as you were talking about. You just said the NFL is the biggest game in this country. I got to ask the question, and maybe you can explain it to me because I truly don't know in our audience. The NBA, as somebody that talks about the NBA NBA predominantly, it's exciting to me. I watch NFL games. They're fun, but I enjoy to watch uh, NBA games more. At the beginning, you mentioned that the the, the NFL can can be like military where you have its order, Everybody wears the same jersey and stuff like that. So given all of those restrictions, given how principled they are, how is it that the NBA that markets all of its stars, it's more flashy, you can see the stars' faces and all of that, how is it that the NFL still continues to bring in more people than the NBA? How is that possible? Uh, Yeah, it's a couple of reasons. Um, Not so obvious, but then you're kind of like, oh, yeah, right under my nose. Um, One... It's a better television product when mm. you talk about the NFL mm. versus the NBA. Like, if you go to a game, an NFL game, I don't care where you sit, you feel like you've done something and you also have participated in something you didn't want to do. Like, mm. fights everywhere, you know, mm. like people spilling beer, people yelling, people boisterous. It's family friendly, but it's not so friendly to the family all the time, mm. right? And I, I'm a season ticket holder. Clippers and Chargers, and I'm just giving you the difference of experiences. So we call them yellow jackets. Those security guards, they always are working at an NFL game. Mm. They could take a game or two off in the NBA. Like, you got a heckler here or there, but other than that, somebody yelling at James Harden or Russell Westbrook, ain't nobody tripping. Mm. NFL, there's always somebody tripping. So the experience is actually better being at home watching football that has a built-in timeout every single play, something to digest, sitting on your couch, you're chilling, you just can watch it easier. Mm. Then the NBA, where you take this deep breath and you got to hold your breath because they're going back, 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 Mm. back, back, back. They go, and then they take a little timeout, whatever it may be. It's just a different production Mm. and it is easier consumed in the NFL than the NBA. But that's not the greatest reason. Mm. The greatest reason is... And I learned this in sociology that fans really sign up to watch sports to live 
this voyeuristic experience, to, to live this experience where take me through what you guys have experienced, right? Mm. And so when you look at it vicariously, like I want to see something I can't do. I want to see something I am not willing to do. Mm. The mm. NBA is close, but the NBA is closer than the NFL. NFL, you see guys getting laid out, knocked right. around, beat up, <laughs> rounding through. It's like, hell no. Nah. You watch an NBA guy dunk, you be like, oh, maybe I should try, I should that. try that. And yep. you go out in the back and touch the net. <laughs> <laughs> and then you try to hope to jump to get the rim. <laughs> then you go to the actual gym down the street and see 20 dudes doing that. And the NFL... You ain't going to no local gym and seeing nobody do any of that. Right. And that's why I think the experience is different. You see it better produced. It's easier to digest. And they're frankly doing something your ass can't do. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's something in it where you've seen the movie Gladiator and people go crazy? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's this kind of like gladiator element where people just love to see like all of this, you know, testosterone and guys like, you know, do you think that plays any kind of role in it where it's like, man, this is a gladiator sport where it's like, you know, a man's man's game. Do you think that plays any role or no? Uh, it's a minor detail. Okay. I think it's, it's certainly a, a, a ingredient. I don't think it's a main ingredient because look, boxing is not captivating to the audience at large anymore, unless it's a major, major fight, but on the general no. What is it? The NFL has 97 of the top 100 broadcasts of last year. Like 97 wow. and then three other <coughs> things, me, right? And I don't know what those things are, but it was big. Wow. Other than that, it's all NFL. Boxing, UFC, they don't command the same audience as the NFL. And they're more brutal, more combative, mm -hmm. <laughs> more gladiator than anything. Matter of fact, they're pure gladiator sports. Football is a gladiator blend. Like it's this beautiful symphony of brutality, right? Mm -hmm. So it's different. It's just simple as this. They packaged it, they produced it, and they have something now that the person at home truly respects from a distance. Because people will watch an NBA game and literally go grab their boys and get some run and do the same thing to some version. I ain't never <laughs> seen a guy watch a football game. Like, hey, dog, what you doing later? Let's go down to the park and go play. Man, that's for them fools. Like, and I think that's what we buy into. That's the most entertaining part. It's just harder to do. <laughs> it's harder to do. So I got, I got, I got another question. I'm, I'm going to kind of jump somewhere, somewhere else. I wanted to go somewhere, but I, I want to jump somewhere else. I was listening to a clip on ESPN. And they were talking about, it's, it's twofold. They were talking about the Ravens versus the Kansas City Chiefs game. And Stephen A. Smith was talking about Lamar Jackson, who we're going to get to in a second. As he was talking, he said something which was, but Patrick Mahomes is the greatest football player or the best football player to ever play football. And as somebody that doesn't follow the NFL that close, I was like, man, I thought it was Tom Brady. I kept on hearing it's Tom Brady is the greatest ever. So I got to ask you, someone who played in the NFL, who knows football at a very high level. Number one, what makes Patrick Mahomes so great? Yeah, you know, not to parse words. Um, there is a huge conversation, usually in the locker room, but media talks about it as well. Greatest versus best. Mm. Um, greatest running back all time. You probably say Emmitt Smith. I think a lot of people would say because he has the team success and the records. Mm -hmm. Best running back all time. I think most people say Barry Sanders. Like dog. I don't care how many games they won. I don't care. I mean, Barry Sanders is the best. Um, so we get caught up in that a lot. And I don't know what Stephen A. said exactly, but when you talk about greatest football player ever, everyone says it's Tom Brady. Right. But when you say best football player ever, you start saying Deion Sanders, Lawrence Taylor, you know, you can start getting into different conversations, Barry Sanders, et cetera. But what doesn't bring them to the level of greatest is usually they don't have that team success. Uh, they don't have that, that level of achievement and accolade with teams that they have one ring, two rings, whatever, no rings. And when you think about Tom Brady, you're like, yes, seven. <laughs> so it's right. like, he was not only one of the best players, but damn it, he got seven of those things. Shut it down. It's a wrap. Now, with Patrick Mahomes, he's on pace to rival that. 
you know, mm-hmm. maybe even eclipse it. We don't know because Tom Brady won four rings in his 30s. So we don't know what Mahomes is going to mm-hmm. do in his 30s. But what makes him so good is the intangible, tangible conversation that we have for Tom Brady. Now we're having for Patrick Mahomes. Tom Brady's intangibles were so great that they made people recalculate what a football player looks like. Hmm. Because before it was all measurables, all tangibles. All right, I want you to go over there and tell me how tall you are. All right, how much do you weigh? All right, take your shirt off. Ugh, you ain't got no muscles. Okay, throw it to that guy on the side who's going to be uncovered at the combine. Oh, man. Uh, How did you play at school? Uh." And then we had this conversation of that's how we draft. And then you watch Tom Brady's career, and you realize that calculation was missing so many variables. Hmm. You can't measure the will. You can't measure the level of grit. You can't measure his leadership. So now we're looking like, how do we measure it? And then we get somebody like Patrick Mahomes, who qualifies with the tangibles. So when he does all those physical things like Tom Brady did, you're like, okay, 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 better than Tom Brady? I'm impressed. With Tom Brady, you were suspicious. But now you see how his team responds to him. You see how he is in clutch moments. You see how willing he is to give to his team. And then you see his intangibles too. And then you simply say this. Tom Brady's intangibles and Patrick Mahomes, comparable. But tangible in terms of physical, in terms of what you can do with the ball and arm talent and skills, not comparable. Patrick Mahomes got him beat. Mm. So now you're starting to put him in conversations with Tom Brady because he can do everything Tom Brady can do physically and mentally as close as we've seen any other player. Wow. wow. So it's a real comparison. Like, it's not like they're just talking for hyper- hyperbole sake. Like, it's real. This Patrick Mahomes, Tom yeah. Brady. Is real. They're not doing that typical media stuff wow. where they just trying to get oh, wow. everybody watching and popcorn, cotton candy. Nah, that's real, man. Like, uh, you know, if you run track or any sport, track is the purest sport. It's the best sport to always use as example. The thing is, most people don't watch track. But there are eight-year-olds. I know the record books. Uh, Obi Moore, Steve Lewis, uh, Dengue Newsome, Eric Allen. I'm flexing right now. I'm trying to show people I know track. And most of y'all have not heard of one of those people. Except they were the world record holders at their age all the way till they got older. Hmm. And then there's this guy by the name of Usain Bolt who has some records. Ah. But all of a sudden, he's the one that's the GOAT. But step by step, there were other guys outpacing him. So Mm. that's this conversation. Mm. Is Patrick Mahomes, because he's outpacing or step by step with Tom Brady, going to end up Usain Bolt insane, end up Tom Brady? Or is he going to end up? Oh, then gain Newsom, Eric Allen, another guy who was fast in the beginning. And then at the end, it didn't measure up to the greatest. Mm. So he's on pace to doing what Tom Brady did, if not more. But is he going to finish the deal? Is he going to become the Usain Bolt of football? We'll see. We got to wait and see. Speaking of Patrick Mahomes, they recently beat the um, Baltimore Ravens. And Lamar Jackson, who a lot of people are picking to win the regular season uh, MVP, some people are saying that he choked. Other people are saying, no, it's not that he joked. It was the greatness of Patrick Mahomes and how he was able to outperform that defense and everything. What do you think happened with the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson in that game? Yeah, I don't like the word choke. And I know what people mean by it. And look, I'm not going to testify against it in court, but I'm like, choke is tough, man. When you're playing at the highest level and you're playing in the higher stakes and the bigger stages, they're going to take away your plan A. People don't right. understand, like, in the regular season, we're trying to figure out what our plan A is. And you are, too. So we're just playing these games, and it's a turnaround so fast. We're just going out there with our strengths. Then you get to the playoffs, and they have all of this evidence, this entire year of resume, that they can now say, this is their plan A. Let's take it away. So you got to play plan B football better than your opponent, or you're not going to be able to win. Mm. And when you went out there and saw the Baltimore Ravens, this is what happened to them. Two things. One, they weren't able to play the way that they weren't playing the whole year. They ran the ball all year. Now they're trying to throw the ball 82% of the time because you're thinking that you got to go plan B. Kansas City gets the ball. They go down and score. You're behind the entire game with a running attack. They should have stuck to the run, Mm. but they started to think, oh, maybe we need to blend this or maybe we need to throw the ball more because they were taken away, et cetera, and then they fell into the trap. Once you're in that trap, 
like any trap. It's hard to get out, dog. Like people be thinking like, oh man, we just just switch it up. It's 60 minutes, it happens like that. And next thing you know, you called another play that you shouldn't. And then you got yourself in another bad position. In terms of Lamar Jackson, man, hmm. he fell victim to that, that mentality that it's not for black quarterbacks, it's for mobile quarterbacks. Hmm. Cause Steve hmm. Young had to deal with it. Hmm. But it largely lands on black quarterbacks. And it's this whole mentality of like, oh, they don't think I could throw from the pocket. Okay, watch me show them. Mm. And I've seen hundreds of quarterbacks fall victim to that. In the NFL, I've seen some big names fall victim to that. Donovan McNabb, when he started mm. to come down the hill, uh, didn't want to be as dynamic. You know, you can hear Michael Vick at times say this. Uh, guys just want to prove to somebody that I could do it all. Nah, dog, do what you do best. And there were too many moments where Lamar Jackson, he just, just took off. Take off, dog, take it. The there was a third and one, and he literally rolled around for 10 seconds instead of just getting one yard, first down, and then let's go back to pure pocket passing. Mm. I was like, oh, they in his head mm, right now. Mm. And his offensive coordinator for calling those plays in the first place. But somebody should have shook Lamar Jackson to say, dog, it's okay be who you are, not what they think you need to be. And I think he fell victim to that. So next time he's in this position on this stage, trust me, he's going he gonna to respond differently. And so do you think that it was a question of coaching or maybe they overthought, maybe it was, uh, they, they were doing too much overthinking? Do you, in a situation like that, do you blame it on the coach? Do you blame it on the quarterback? Is it, does, it, does the blame go all around? Uh, how, how do you, how do you, how do you what, what do you attribute that loss to then? If you have to say, okay, you messed uh, I'm gonna up. I'm going to start with the coaching because okay. 82%, 82%. Like, they were dropping back and pass. They they ran the ball six times in the first half, the running backs. And like, out of the game, they just – I don't know why they thought they were out of that game. Look, the 49ers were down 17. They ran the ball 33 times. They're like, look, I mean, <laughs> this is how we got here. This is how we're going to get there. And, you know, simple was that. They got too cute in Baltimore. And I swear they were on this mission because it's a new offensive coordinator and he came in and fixed the offense. There's no more Greg Roman. Now we're going to go out there. We're not going to be the same old Baltimore Ravens. And then Lamar, you got all that money and you can do it all. You're going to win MVP again. So yeah, man, just sit back there and dart them. Mm, nope, that's not how it went. And they couldn't go to plan B. Mm. They were either reluctant or it was just getting stopped. Point being, if I would have designed that game, looking at it now, mm. retroactively, I literally would have put him in run pass options and told him there's no option. Run. <laughs> I would have forced him to run the ball to threaten that defense because as a former defender, there's nothing worse than when we guard you for the three seconds, four seconds, and then you take off and get the first down. Nothing's more defeating. Okay. It, it, it demoralizes you guys when that when something like that happens. Then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I got to get to another I got to get to another question here. Um, we've been I've been listening. Now we I've been listening to people complain about what's going on in the NBA. Let me give you some data. I actually pulled this up. I said, let me let me be ready uh, for Marcellus when he comes on this time. So he knows that <laughs> so he knows that we're serious. A lot of people have been complaining <laughs> about, about the 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 crazy numbers we're seeing in the NBA. Luka just scored 73. Joel Embiid just scored 70. Uh, 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 Devin Booker just scored 62. And I looked at, listen to this, I looked at the average score per game this season in the NBA is 115.6, and teams are attempting 35 three-point shots per game. If I go back to 2017, the average score was 106. And now people are beginning to ask the question, is the scoring too much? Is there too much offense in the NBA? Do you think that the NBA uh, – do you think that the NBA is getting it wrong at this point? So the question I have to ask for you is, do you think there's too much offense in this particular NBA? I don't, and I don't think the NBA oh, wow. does. Um, <clears throat> no, look, look, the NBA, they, they rig the rules to the place where they want the game to go. Well, the rules have been rigged so that offense can shine. Right. Just like in the NFL. Why you can't touch a receiver after five yards? When I play, you could you could go out there and assault them all up and down the field. Now you better not touch them <laughs> after five yards because they were tired of seeing six to three 
end of game uh, scores. They were like, oh, here we go. When Tennessee used to play uh, Baltimore back in the days, it'd be three to zero. <laughs> Nobody want to see that, dog. Nobody want to see. We want to see 39 to 36, maybe the same three-point differential. So the NBA, I don't understand people. People people are crazy. People don't know what they even like. They like scoring. What they want is some resistance. Right. However, it's tougher to have resistance because the pace of play is faster. Ain't nobody running no Princeton offense and no half court offense anymore. These cats ain't walking the ball up the court. They're not even traditional point guards. So as soon as you get the ball, break, let's go. Who running. running? Who on the wings? Let's go. So that's part one. Two, we stopping and dropping threes. We not remember back in the days when we used to watch basketball. Boy, if you on a fast break and you stop and shoot a three, even if you make you it, you get game. cursed out. Like, you out of the, the game. You, you out of the game. Doing? You out of the game. Yeah. You, yeah. you out of the game. Yeah. What you doing? Yeah. So now <laughs> these cats are on a break. Sure. Shoot that three. You got to do it. Also, you got to remember they're not only playing to our sensibilities. We like offense. We like pace. Uh, the NBA is doing well in terms of the ratings. But we also have more skilled players than ever. Ah, uh, here we go. Like here, here, literally. Here, here you go. Here you go with this. Here you go with this. Last time we had an argument about this. Here you go. Here you come with this one. <laughs> here you go. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you haven't seen these. I just went and saw Sherman Oaks Notre Dame play against Crespi. Sherman Oaks Notre Dame is number five team in the country, or at least they were until they lost to Sierra Canyon. I'm all into this youth level stuff because this is where it all starts. Man, there's a kid by the name of Mercy Miller, Master P's son. Oh, wow. He is insane. Wow. He's going to Houston next year to play ball. He could go anywhere he wants. Most composed, poised, skilled kid. They got kids jumping out the gym. Russell White's son is there. It's insane. Point being, these kids are more skilled. I go to where they train pros. I, uh, my son goes to these facilities where they train the pros. The guys in there, 6'11", handles. We see 7'5", Wimby, handles. We see Bobo, handles. These kids are more skilled than ever, and their skills are on display. So what, are, what am I saying by this? In football, you know you can't stop the perfect pass. And what's the perfect pass? The one he can't drop. If a quarterback and a receiver are on that level, Jerry Rice, Montana, Kelsey, and Mahomes, you can't stop it. You could slow down other things. That's going to happen. It's the same thing in the NBA. You can't stop the perfect shot. What you going to do? Wimby going to go out there and guard the three. Who going to guard the basket? You can't stop the perfect shot. So these kids more skilled are abusing these rules that are already more favorable for them offensively. Mar Mar Marcellus, they're going they gonna to get on me in the comments if I, if, I don't, if, I don't go, if I don't push back at you with this, uh, oh, push. this, 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 push. Uh, this more skill. You, you, you know I disagree with you when it comes to the skill. To me, I think that the NBA now is selecting out for, for dudes that can dribble the ball, they can shoot the ball, but these Thank dudes you. cannot play defense. You got to admit that. They don't play defense. Right. They ain't got no post game whatsoever. Yeah. And a lot of them, I think, like, I was watching a video. Who was I listening to? I was watching a video of Kobe Bryant talking about how the AAU, not even just Kobe, Robert Horry, so many guys talking about how AAU is kind of messing up a lot of these guys. They don't have the fundamentals uh, anymore. To me, I just think that they just decided to focus on three-point shooting and dribbling the basketball. And guys no longer, can, they no longer have a mid-range shot. They can no longer play with their backs towards the basket. It's just this, like, one-dimensional basketball and to me personally, although the uh, Adam Silver says the ratings are good, people, I mean, he says people are watching. To me, I wish that there was just more defense because I was watching a highlight before we got on the before we got on the call, and I'm like, I looked at the score. It was it was a Celtics game, and I saw Derek White hit the three, and I'm like, oh, the game is over. And I looked, I was like, man, it's just at the end of the third quarter, and it's like 89. I'm like, Jesus Lord, we still going? <laughs> so I was like, man. Yeah. They got to do something, man. It's it's just, it is just insane. But I definitely hit Okay, Charles, so you just like the rest of the people don't know what they like. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you two extreme options. Okay. Tell me this. Would you rather see this shot clock, 24 seconds? One second has elapsed. The, it's at 23. Okay. And somebody jack a three up and drain it on, over somebody. Okay. Like mosses somebody and drains three. Or would you rather see this? Defense. 
And then it's 10, 9, 8, and he's still pounding the rock. 6, 5, he passing it around the perimeter. 4, like college basketball. Boring. 3, 2, 1. And <laughs> shot cock violation. Okay. That's great defense. Okay, I, see what I gave you great offense. I gave you great <laughs> defense. And then I'm talking about 90 reps of that. 90 possessions, 100 possessions of that. Tell me which one you want. I don't know, man. Maybe it's because I'm a Kawhi <laughs> fan. I like, I like two-way ball, man. I'm just like, man, everybody just like, all right, you go ahead. You lay it up, you lay it. <laughs> Excuse me, you okay. lay it. And back to the basket and all that, it, like the mid-range game is gone, not because of Adam Silver or anything. It's just because it's not a, a effective. Yeah, it's not efficient. effective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, you can, make, you can make it, but at the same time, either make a layup or shoot a three because of just analytics. We get that. Back to your basket. Like that was a skill that came from, be real, those at that time who couldn't blow by someone. Or they were just too big. So you went back to the basket, old school Kareem with the sky hook, or are you talking about anybody with that skill set? Started because you weren't a traditional guard. It wasn't just because you kids try to do it now. When somebody just you try to dribble face up and then they rip you, next thing you know, you turn around. Cause you already saw the frailty, you already saw that somebody has a superior skill set or defense on you. So we gave that so much credit, like that was a great attribute, but that was really just them trying to counter, this fool gonna rip me if I look at him straight in his eyes. So that's how that game went. So so basically you're saying that you would, personally, you would enjoy watching a game where the, the pace is faster, guys are getting up the court faster, more dunks, more threes, versus maybe a game where guys are scoring in the post, scoring in the mid-range, and score a more balanced game. You prefer the faster pace, higher scoring game, basically. Yeah, I take now over the Spurs okay. when they were winning the championship. Okay, okay, I got you. I <laughs> you got, know what I mean? Like, that's, that sounds like the Spurs yeah, to me. And, I, and every year we heard people say, please don't let the Spurs be in the championship just because of excitement and ratings, right, right, not I because remember. of how good they were. I remember. They're both great brands. It's just... I went to a Clipper game the other day. I swear it was 154 to 148. And I was sitting there the whole time spilling juice and just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, having a good time. Just, just too, too exciting, man. It happens so fast. It's so good, man. Well, These kids are skilled, man. Now, now that we're talking about the Clippers, I want to, because you know we got to talk about the Clippers. Now that we're talking about the Clippers. First of all, first of all, what are your thoughts on the Clippers being, since December 1st, 22 and 4? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, Jesus. I mean, uh, I am guilty, just like you, of not knowing what I need most <laughs> and what I like best because I didn't want James Harden. Exactly. And James, exactly. James, I apologize again. Every time I see him on the, at the game, and you know, I don't know if we don't like each other anymore, but we're just not as cool as we used to be. He must have heard okay, me. Okay, y'all see each other. Y'all actually see each other. Oh, yeah. Well, he I see all them dudes all the time. Okay, okay. They all the homies, but... James and I, I don't know if he be in game mode, but he ain't as homie as he used to be. But I'm sure if I saw him outside of game mode, it'd be better. Be but cool. he'd be looking at me like, mm. and <laughs> like, James, I'm sorry, dog. I was just talking from a fan perspective. But now I am a fan of that man. When he at the top of the key, Charles, and he start doing that little, little between the legs and that little, that little wiggly, wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> and all he doing is setting up which way I'm going to dive, and then he going to dive down that lane. And he going to dive on that edge and that shoulder. And if you, when Zubac was healthy, or Theus, or whatever, whatever, when they dive with him, it's rap. Yeah, it's a rap. It's just like points it's a rap. every time, it's a dog. Rap. It's sick. He, he, James Harden, I mean, we all knew James Harden was good. Ever since Westbrook went to the bench, and we're going to get to him in a second, I'm looking at James Harden play. And it looks so easy for this dude. He be making, especially with those pick and rolls, he be making some of those passes. And I'm like, it is like it it looks so effortless. And I think he gave this Clipper team something that they didn't have because I think if the Clippers did not have James Harden and you replace him with another point guard and Russell Westbrook is still on the bench, I think they lose some of these games that they've been winning. I think for whatever it is, mm -hmm. he makes that team harder to defend. For whatever, I don't know exactly what it is, but man, he, this dude has been. Uh, I think it's because he, he he really operates top of the key, like a a, a real court general. Right. And it, it allows spacing. You'll see Norman Powell just hanging out in that corner all the time. Um, you, you'll see guys just sitting there waiting on the threes, traditional, right? 
But what, what's different about him as a point guard is people don't respect his body enough. Now, mm -hmm. I know James Harden has not taken conditioning to the Kobe Bryant level. Right. We all know that. But when you're out there playing, this ain't about what kind of diet you on. This is about, like, I got to deal with this man. Right. And he's in good enough shape and big enough that he imposes his will on those who are guarding him. Right. So that's why he used to always make people foul him. Because they're like, dog, this sucker's not only crafty, but he a low. Right. And James right. Harden is still not in perfect shape. But guess what? It ain't a ton wiggling on him, and he's a low. So yeah. it's kind of like Zion. You know, like people try to hate on Zion. I'm like, dog. He's a load. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. when I played in the league, they used to always have these stereotypical old linemen that everybody thought was the best. And I was like, yeah, they are. They are the best. They got the big names. They are the Hall of Famers to be. Yeah. But what y'all ain't respecting is these little fire hydrants, I used to call mm. them. These little stumpies. Mm. Like this little six foot two, three thirty dude who you can't move because he got leverage. He's just sitting there like a bathtub. Like, go ahead. And that's James Harden. That's Zion. Like, they low center of gravity. They leverage. They thick. Man, they just too much right, to deal right. with. And that's why I think that Kawhi, PG, they're able to go to their sweet spots and just roam because James Harden go attack every single yeah, time. Yeah, he's, he's, he's been incredible, man. Uh, I think he's made the game a lot easier for Kawhi, as you just said, for Paul George and these guys. But I think all of this, and I think you agree, all of this changed when Russell Westbrook went to the bench. And I've seen some, uh, I think I saw on your IG, like a video of you, like greeting Westbrook. You, you guys seem to be friendly. What do you think? Like, what do you think about the leadership of Russell Westbrook and the role he has played on this team in terms of the success and the positive energy he's been, he's given the Clippers? How much, wh what do you think about Russell Westbrook and what he's been doing? Yeah, Westbrook, the homie, man, family, friend, our kids go to school together. They in the same class. So I see them all the time. So, you know, it's a deep respect for him. Not only um, I'm older, obviously, uh, from the same area, L.A., so uh, a lot of the same sensibilities. Um, what I respect about him the most in this moment is <clears throat> not just taking that back seat, like, all right, I'm going to take the, the small contract, you know, two years, right. eight million, right. but I'm going to ball out. Think about that. People forgot, like, two years, right. eight million to prove I'm still Westbrook. Then you get there, and you are Westbrook. Like, like damn, right. he balling. And then they get James Harden, and it ain't mixing. You know, the water is not mixing with the oil. And they are homies. You know, they grew up in the same area, too. We all from here. So it's like, it's like, ah, what do I do? Remember, his incentives are going to shape his behavior. I need to start. I need to play. Right, right. I need to be the Good man point. to get up out this two-year, $8 million exactly. deal. He put all of that to the side to just say, let me come off the bench and do what I do best, which is bring energy, attack mode, and hold people accountable and li uh, make them liable to what their efforts are. So, hey, you're not going in. You're not going 100. You do not want to be a teammate with Russell Westbrook. <laughs> that sucker mm. there looking at you like, and I see it. So knowing him, he's holding a, the second unit accountable. Yep. But it also pushes the first unit because you know they coming in and ain't no way they should be doing better than you. Ain't no way they should be outshining you. But there's a Hall of Famer coming off the bench, the bench yeah. who is fully motivated back at the crib showing out. So it was an amazing move. I don't know if I would have raised my hand to do it. Hmm. Um, and I think it was tough on Westbrook to do it. Uh, but he knew he was in a bad position. He was in a true dilemma, two bad decisions. If he starts and his team doesn't do well, he's getting killed. Mm -hmm. And if he comes off the bench, it's going to hurt him personally, but hurt the, but help the team. I think that's two bad choices for Westbrook personally, but he made the lesser of the two evil choices. Hmm. No, um, I, I, I definitely agree, man. I think Russell Westbrook, that move he made, uh, made him the unsung hero uh, for this team. I was recently, we actually got a show coming out today, later today, where I was listening to ESPN First Take. They were talking about, it was yesterday, it was uh, Stephen A. Smith, it was Shannon Sharp and Kendrick Perkins, and they were asking, um, yeah, who's the number one threat to the Nuggets the, uh, this season? And they mentioned the Clippers. And then they brought up, and then Stephen A. Smith brought up Russell Westbrook. And he said that a lot of people 
were critical of what Russell Westbrook. A lot of people trashed him. And in today's show, I talked about it. I said, you know, Shannon Sharp was amongst them. I didn't hide my feelings because the way him and Skip Bayless went at Russell Westbrook for that year and a half when he was a Laker, I thought, mm. I thought it was ridiculous. I thought like, okay, at one point we're analyzing the game. Now you guys are just picking on this dude. Like it's, it's too much. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the criticism he got turned a lot of us into Westbrook fans because I was never a Westbrook fan. Do you think that the media and these guys owe Russell Westbrook an apology or do you think that they're just going to say, hey, we're just doing our job and it is what it is? Uh, but do you think that these guys went too far with their criticism, the Skip Baylesses and all of these guys? Oh, yeah, they do. I mean, <clears throat> look, the game at the major media level is a gimmick now. Um, and, mm. and it, mm, that's a bar. I, I hate when they, mm. they don't want to admit it, but I don't need them to admit it because I saw it and sat through it. <laughs> you know. Mm. And so this is what's happening at the major media level. Rex Ryan has just fallen victim. We lost Rex Ryan, y'all. Uh, we lost Shannon. We lost Stephen A. Like, and it's okay because they're doing a different part of the circus, and we're all in the circus. Mm. Um, so in their tent, now they put extras on everything. And worse... For those who formerly played or coached, they doing it just to keep up with those who didn't play. Hmm. So they acting like they don't get it, and they acting and dumbing down like those who didn't play, like Stephen A. Smith, hmm. Skip Bayless, hmm. Colin Coward. Hmm. Uh, and I love Dan Patrick. He ain't in this conversation, but he is one of the big dogs who didn't play. Um, I could get Jim Rome. Jim Rome's in that 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 conversation. So there's this is what happens. Those those dudes didn't play. Now. It's funny whenever we see a high school coach or Pop Warner coach who didn't make it to the league, who comes at his players a little weird and like yells a lot and is just tripping and way too much into it and does too much. We always say, oh, it's because he didn't make it. So he living through those kids. But when we see the media cat like Stephen and A and all them do it, who didn't make it. We don't say the same thing. Mm. Then we were like, oh, yeah, that's the deep uh, expert analysis. Mm. I'm like, nah, mm. he living through them kids, too. Mm. He mad a little bitter, whatever it may be. But all the former players, and you remember this, every former player used to get hired because they had to be who they were as a player. Jalen Rose, talk basketball, and that's it. Marcellus mm. Wiley, talk football, and that's it. And then I got Sports Nation, cats start going on all the shows, and they start realizing – let them talk about sports. They they played at least one sport at the highest level, and they're certainly interested and expert in other sports. So then now we're competing truly with Skip Bayless, mm -hmm. Stephen A. Smith, because mm -hmm. before they had their protected lane, and we couldn't get in a lane, they couldn't get in our lane, and then none of us could get into the host lane, right? Mm -hmm. None of us could be the host of the, Mike Greenberg, et cetera, right? So everybody had three lanes. And then they were like, wait a minute, we can merge these lanes so Stephen A can become a host slash or he can become who he is. And then you start seeing us start to be like them. So to compete, to get the big money, to get the big attention, you can't just go over there and just say it from some informed uh, position. You can't just break it down into You got to go over the top. You can't just yeah. do it, mm. you know? You got to put something on it. Mm, mm, <laughs> and so now you hear him put something... How in the hell? Look, Shannon Sharp's a Hall of Famer. Russell Westbrook's a Hall of Famer. You would think they would be in the fraternity respecting right, okay, the game. Like, you. nah, dog, I know how hard it right. is to be a Hall of Famer. But instead, he ain't in that game no more. Shannon in the uh, Skip Bayless right, and Stephen A. Right, Smith right, game. Right, right, right. So he putting hot sauce and blasting other Hall of Famers when Westbrook didn't deserve that. So I just sat there and giggled when cats start doing it. And uh -huh. now you got next level. You got cats that didn't even play or didn't play well attacking cats, mm, right? You, mm. This whole freaky thing between Acho and Justin Herbert needs to stop. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to put an end to it. <laughs> so these cats is like, I'm like, dog, I would never, ever, ever disrespect somebody I know that could beat me at it. Like, I'm just right. going to be like, look, you playing bad. You horrible right now. This ain't it. But you still the dude, right? <laughs> right? right. You got me beat. But they ain't talking from that position no more because that ain't their competition anymore. It's, it, you were saying something about they didn't play. This is a perfect segue into the main thing I wanted to talk to you about like two weeks ago, but unfortunately we could not get in it. We got to talk about Jason Whitlock, man, and what he said about mm. Steve. We got to, because I saw your show. I saw your show <laughs> when you were going through the uh, Stephen A. Smith story, and you were like, 
this is some Final Fantasy stuff right here. So I got a bunch of questions I got to ask you. <laughs> First of all, okay. what do you think about Jason? Because, I mean, Jason Whitlock, he went through this long thing. And I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of like hot and cold on him, but I decided to watch. And when he went on the, when he went on this kind of crusade and he was investigating Stephen A. Smith's background and all of that, and he got into the college career stuff, and in the 1.5, he said he was averaging a game. Then Stephen A. Smith said he only played one game, and we were like, but how do you average 1.5? You only play one game. And then he said he didn't play any games. What did you think about that whole thing of <laughs> Jason Whitlock going at Stephen A. Smith, and what did you think about Stephen A. Smith's response back to Jason Whitlock? Yeah, it, I think all in all, it was beautiful and necessary, and I need more of that. Um, now, I'm not the one, like, it just seems like, Charles, you are on the pulse of sports media. Oh. Like, matter of fact, I need to just bite your show. I need to get your topic sent to me <laughs> so I can know what to talk about because you don't let anything get by. I watch your show all the time. I'm like, damn, why not do that topic? So the point is, you are on it. You and Marco kill it. Here's the thing. I'm not always there. And people who watch my show know. They were like, yeah, Wally, when are you going to talk about this? Right, I'm right. like, what I you mean? You that, and I'm right. like, tell me what it is. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't get... So I didn't know that Whitlock was killing Stephen A and Stephen A was trying to avoid Whitlock and then finally it happened. But then I caught wind. Wow. And when I caught wind, I still delayed probably compared to the average bear. Um, but I watch Whitlock's show, not regularly, but a lot. Um, and I watch Stephen A. Smith's show a lot. Um, here's the thing. Stephen A obviously was lying, but I try to respect people and say it like this. I don't know if you lying, but you certainly not telling the truth, you know, but I don't put it in the category of when he was 19, he made up this story and is just stuck to it his whole life. No, this is the same thing we see when you go to college. As soon as you get to college, every single person that you're meeting probably is a different person than they were in high school. Mm. Not because they really change, it's because their story changed. Mm. <laughs> every mm. single fool I met as a freshman, oh man, I'm from the hood. Oh yeah, could. I'm <laughs> like, wait a minute. You, you? I was like, don't let me go home with you. And then I go home with you and I'm like, you ain't the hard one. Cause the hard one wouldn't have done all the work necessary to get exactly. here. You, you man, stop. That's your family, <laughs> fool. So. I've always been soft. I've always been the punk. I've always been the one that laughs when you want to fight. I've always been the one giggling. I ain't about to fight you, fool. Because one, I know I'm going to win. But two, <laughs> I don't want to even get into it with you. It's funny, Charles, you're laughing. Somebody walked up to me at the Clipper game last time I was. And they was like, damn, why do you write? Ain't nobody going to mess with you. You really are big in real life. I was like, no, don't let this TV fool you, bro. I put these paws on you. So here's the thing. So I'm looking at these cats. I'm like, man, everybody got a story, right? And they all try to exaggerate it. So I think Stephen A just exaggerated his story. And I fell victim to this before. I used to not claim Compton when I was in the NFL at first. It was like, I'm from LA. Hmm. And I just thought that that was enough until it felt like Compton got mad at me. Like, nah, you were from Compton. Hmm. And then you gonna act like you ain't cause you in the NFL hmm. now. I was like, actually it's a compliment to be from Compton but I wasn't on, I was there for my first six years, and then I was only there every weekend. But mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm from Compton, but... And then they made me have to claim Compton. Mm -hmm. Then L.A. talking about, you ain't claiming L.A. And then Slauson oh, wow, and the Overhills wow, talking about, you wow, ain't... Wow. And then they get real gangster and deep. So I'm like, man, look, I can understand where sometimes you leave something out just to keep the story going. Uh, as they say, the greatest storytellers are the ones who forget what to say. Like, don't bring every detail to every conversation. Forget some of those details. So maybe Stephen A forgot Bro, <laughs> some of the he, details. I, I, you, you, but you, I don't know. You, it it sounds like a lot. You be you be a night. He was straight up capping, man. Marcel, Mar Mar I sat back and I watched your show, and he was talking about you were talking about the recruitment story, and you were like, "Oh yeah, yeah. exactly what you said." You no. were like, "I'm not gonna say you're yeah, lying, no. but you're definitely not telling the truth." He was like. You were like, that never happens. And for him to not respond to that specific point, I was like, man, this is uh, this is absolutely incredible. So let me ask you, uh, Jason Whitlock says that it's not personal with him and Stephen A. Smith, but he has made it his business to constantly try to expose him. Do you think that there's something, something happening 
maybe behind the scenes that we don't know? Or do you think that Jason Whitlock just said, hey, today I'm going to decide to talk about Stephen A. Smith and that's it. Do you think there's like this other beef? Because the way he went at him and it kept on going at him, even after you responded, <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, Lord, what's going on here? I warned Stephen A. I mean, I ain't have to warn him. He knows Jason Whitlock. And um, I warned the world, I guess, that doesn't know Jason Whitlock. Um, he's a dog. Stephen A's a dog. I'm a dog. We all dogs. Uh, but I remember reading about this. We're just all different types and breeds of dogs, mm. right? I am a Rottweiler. Like, I'm kind of lazy with this stuff. I'll let you just get some jokes off, some shots off. I'm just sitting there by the front door. I see somebody on the porch. I'm just staring at him. Then he walk over there. I'm just looking at him. But when it's time to go, I'm going to go. I, that's what kind of dog I am. Whitlock is a pit bull. <laughs> like once he locks in on you, you may think it's personal, but he just doing the business to the fullest. Mm. Like I've worked with him before. It consumes him because he does his homework. I don't know anyone else. And this is no shots at anybody's how they get their work done and how they prepare. But I don't know anybody that works with more investigative like determination than Whitlock on any topic. Wow. Now that could take him to where when you watch him, you're like, dog, relax or dog that's enough you know why he ain't finished because he has done his homework and mm. be real who in the hell read Stephen A. Smith's book like that people ain't read my book and they be coming up to me oh man your book is a man man fool you ain't read this book <laughs> I, can, I can give you three questions right now like, shut, it, shut it so ain't nobody I, look I'm not built to read nobody's book like that I, I love you you give me the book it's gonna be a pretty trophy I ain't reading that whole thing no I know you that's enough so I don't think anybody read his book but Whitlock did he did man he <laughs> not only did what I was he like bro this and he is... read him his rights cause he read the book I was like he man this, this dude this, and this I'm dude. like wow I was like, man, this dude, man, he, he was, he, and he, I, I personally think that because some people were saying that Stephen A. Smith kind of went too far by coming back at him and cursing and all of those things. In the end, I mean, after Stephen A. Smith did his thing and then Jason Whitlock responded, I, I'm, I'm going to give it to Whitlock on that one. I think Whitlock won, actually, if I'm being honest with you, because those points he brought up, Stephen A. Smith never addressed. He talked about other things. And Whitlock addressed the email thing that he said and that he sent to him and all that. But those things that he brought up about the college and all of that, he he, he never refuted it. So I personally think that Whitlock uh, uh, won that beef. Speaking of beef. I'm with you, too. Speaking of beef. I think so, too. And I got caught up in it. I gave it, like, you ever watch a boxing match and be like, man, who in the hell grading? Who judging these scores? Like, like boo. I gave a bad score. I, at first, I thought it was closer than it was. I thought that, you know, Stephen A caught me with all the profanities right. and and all the, oh, man, fat bastard. Fat and all that. He caught no. me. He got me good. And then I went back and listened again because fans were pushing back on me. Like, why? They keep it 100. I was like, no, I thought he did. And then I started listening for real. I was like, oh, dog. He didn't negate anything. anything. He didn't go at any, any of these points. points. And then it reminded me of when him and I had our conversation for the world to hear. Um, he didn't refute my points either. Like, right, just, right. He kind of like I is remember. the king of distraction. I remember. On the yeah, breakfast. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. No, nah, speak, speaking, of, speaking, of, speaking of drama, it's another year and the Lakers suck again. Uh, right now, I mean, I'm not, I mean, they know, they know. And right now the new talk is who are they going to trade for? Can they trade, uh, the, was it D'Angelo Russell for the John Tate Murray? Can they trade for this guy? Can they trade for that guy? I got to ask you, what is wrong with the Lakers? Uh, I mean, if you really want to keep it short, uh, their best player is 40. <laughs> like, oh, I'm, I'm, like, like, come on, man. Like, do you understand what kind of water coming out that faucet? You better turn. You, you ever, you ever, they coming you ever for you, man. Where either you ain't had the money or it was a drought. My mama, we grew up broke and it was a drought in California. My mama used to be like, turn that water off, my daddy. But turn the water off. I'm like, every time. Because LeBron, look, he can't keep the faucet open all Ooh. damn season, like 82 games worth. So they rationing out LeBron. And then they got to have all these other players that just ain't adding up. Uh, look, D'Angelo Russell coming off the bench as he was for a second there and then coming back into the starting lineup, that all lands on Darvin Ham, who's the homie, who I respect. But right now, when the Lakers brand is compromised, mm. basically meaning it's not winning, 
we're not going to look at LeBron. The Lakers don't look at the stars. When Kobe was not playing his <coughs> best and his body was breaking down, they still didn't even look at Kobe. Right. The Lakers ain't built. They protect that one guy, that star, right? Yeah. But they'll look at everybody else, yeah. and y'all all are disposable. So I think there's going to be some movement. Mm. Uh, probably Austin Reeves, because he's the most talented of value mm. wow. that they can move contract situation. I don't. They don't want to. Um, but at the same time, Darvin Ham's name has been thrown yep. into mm -hmm. the fire. Uh, Austin Reeves in terms of like value. And I don't know what they could do with D'Angelo, frankly, but um, obviously he's been of conversation. But they just going to be sorry this year. Like, you know, like sometimes you just got to understand. I agree. Y'all going to be sorry. I right? agree. Man, you know, I, I, I think it's unfair what they're doing to Darvin Ham because just, what, th three weeks ago, a month ago, when they won That's that, right. uh, uh, what is it, World Play Cup, and tournament. Play, whatever, the, whatever the hell that was, <laughs> they was up there hollering and, and hooing and, oh, we putting up a banner, and no one said anything about Darvin Ham. Then now all of a nope. sudden, he doesn't know how to coach. They need to get rid of the coach. I think it's unfair what they're doing to Darvin Ham, and I think it's, it's a damn shame uh, if, they, if they decide to fire this guy because I'm like, that part. What, 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 what else? I mean, what, what else do you want the guy to do? He was last year. You guys won the Western Conference Finals, and now all of a sudden, he can't coach. I, I don't know. But speaking of speaking of stuff, uh, uh, um, uh, crazy stuff to get you out of here. I don't know if you've heard about the All Star votes when they came out, mm -hmm. but Stephen Curry mm -hmm. got snubbed as an All Star starter. And I just recently read a report from Yahoo Finance saying Stephen Curry had one of the highest selling jerseys. No, the number one. I think was the number one mm. highest selling jersey in the NBA, yet he didn't make the All Star team as a starter. What do you think about that? And do you think that Stephen uh, Stephen Curry got snubbed? Mm, you're saying conspiracy a little. It's bit crazy. Here. Are you saying the NBA is looking towards the future and not uh, the past? So I see your face over there, child. You got that sharp line <laughs> up. I can see what you're saying without you saying it. Um, look. I don't think that these big institutions and entities really get into the minutia like we think. Like the NFL, mm -hmm. oh, Travis Kelsey, he thinks Taylor Swift is cute, so let's hook him up. Like, man, do you understand if that ever really gets exposed, how it just can crumble the brand, wow. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, like, it's not worth it. Um, and I don't think the NBA rigged the voting on Steph Curry, but what rigged it was... We got to remember who is voting, just like who is on social media. Right, right, right. It's it's youngsters. youngsters yeah, it's yeah. people with time and energy yeah. today. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Like, like my old ass ain't voted ever for an all star. I'm not lying. And I'll watch games. Right. I go look. So I have bought jerseys for my son. I have bought season tickets, and I've never voted for the all star. I am not going to buy a Sprite or fill out an app. Right, or, I don't right, know right. what you're supposed to do, but I ain't doing it. And so people like me don't vote for people like Steph. Okay, well, and you. Steph needs people like me because I'm his base. Yeah, right, 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 you know right. what I mean? And then there's some 17-year-old who just got four phones and just standing in line while he's about to buy the new Jordans on Melrose. <laughs> just, ah, SGA, ah, right, SGA, right, Luke, right, Luke, right. Luke. I and so... Point. To me, it's just as simple as that. That's how they rig it. And, and, what, and what do you think about Kawhi being snubbed for the um for the to, as a starter? Do you think Kawhi should have been a starter over Kevin Durant, or do you think that uh, the voters got it right? God, man. Mm. You know, Kevin Durant's my favorite player ever. Oh wow, really? Um, and Kawhi is just my guy. Oh like, wow, goodness. really? Uh, Kevin Durant is from the heavens of basketball. <laughs> like, there is, I know LeBron's the goat, and I uh, know Michael Jordan's the second. There you go with this. Kareem is the third. But Kevin Durant is the best, purest, most beautiful basketball player there we've you, ever there seen. You we go better give him his flowers because I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> I mean, he played with Steph Curry, who didn't make the All-Stars uh, starting this year. And when they played together, who was the better player? It was oh, Kevin Durant. Oh, man, they're going to come so for you. Let's just get – wherever you rank Steph, put Kevin Durant plus – <laughs> Oh, minus one or plus hey, one, whatever you want Y'all go for Marcellus. Well, he's the one saying this. I didn't say this. He's the one, he's the one saying it. I did not say it. These Stephen Curry fans, uh, they definitely going to come for you. And my final question is this, uh, to get you out of here. Super Bowl is, I believe, in about two weeks from now, to a little bit less than two weeks. Who do you yeah, have? A week from Sunday, yep. Who do you have winning the Super Bowl? <clears throat> Man, mm. 
Don't trust me, because I thought it was going to be Baltimore and Detroit. <laughs> I thought it was going to be the players' convention out there. And now all the pimps and players got to stay home to mix on chill. Um, I think it's – man, I think – let's go with the theme of this show. The NFL rigged Taylor Swift. The NBA rigged it for Luka and SGA. They're going to rig it for KC again. <laughs> KC needs to win this. Um, I just don't – you know what it is? If Brock Purdy didn't get hurt last year in the NFC Championship game – they would have made it to the Super Bowl. Probably a loss, but who cares? Point being, those lights that are so bright, you know when you wake up in the morning, you be like, yo, chill, don't open the lights. Right, right, I mean, right. Don't turn on the lights, just open the blinds. I think the Super Bowl is going to be blinding hmm. to him leading this team. Not like he's going to play bad like that. It's just, it's going to take him a second for him to finally fully focus. Okay, to the big stage. In those seconds, yeah. And I think that we saw it happen in the AFC Championship game with Lamar Jackson right. versus Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes can look at the sun. You know how they tell you don't stare at the sun? He can just stare at the sun and be like, mm-hmm, it's all good. <laughs> no adjustment needed. I can stare at the brightest lights there are. And I think those times, those possessions, those opportunities are going to go KC's way. And I think KC wins. Wow. So you think the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl. And you think uh, Patrick Mahomes most likely is going to be the Super Bowl MVP. Most likely. Another one, as they say. Wow. DJ Khaled. It's another one. Well, yeah, we, I think we, so, we, man. We gonna, you disagree? No, I th- I think what for somebody that doesn't watch football, that's why I said today, I'm like, I'm going to ask Marcellus as many football, because I tried to talk football, and they were like, bro, just it's okay. Just <laughs> keep talking about basketball, so it's all right. So I said, when I get you on the show, I'm going to ask you what you think. I don't know. I'm just going to go with your pick, and I'm going to go with – uh, Patrick Mahomes, because they say he's he's as good as Tom Brady, so I'm going to go with them. I don't really know, but that's what I think. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure, but that's that's the person that I'm rolling I'm rolling with as well. I get it. I'll return the favor when the World Cup comes uh, <laughs> comes up. Like, tell me some football. Tell me more about football. All right, I got you, bro. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. But once again, Marcellus, man, thank you for being a part of this show. We look forward to having you regularly on the show, man. It's great energy. The 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 viewers love it. Uh, we can't really, uh, we, yeah. we can't wait to, to embark on a new uh, season this year. So thank you so much for the first uh, installment uh, this year. And we look forward to having you on more shows in the next, in the, in, in the next coming days. We appreciate it, man. Thank you so oh, much. Appreciate you, Charles. Marco, much love to you guys. Dreamers Pro, keep it going. And happy daddy day appreciate for you, you man. Appreciate Everybody you. give them some love in those comments, appreciate man. It's hard you. being a daddy out here. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.